Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the PMA CIBC Summit Series. Today is episode two of season three. Thank you, everyone in the audience today and, to the, and in the industry for such strong support to keep this summit series fresh and with new topics and discussions each month. One new thing that we are going to start doing is following this session, um, keep an eye on your inbox for the summit report, which will be a uh, circular that goes out in print format following these series episodes. Before we get started with our program, we acknowledge the land that we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land, and by doing so, we give our respect to its first inhabitants. Because our, our audience is national, if you're joining us from outside of the Toronto area, I encourage you to learn more about the traditional territories where you live, learn, and work. Finally, we stand in solidarity with the people of Ukraine and we support our friends and neighbors and colleagues here at home during this very difficult time. I encourage you all to visit and support businesses in the Ukrainian community or to donate to the Red Cross Red Crescent Humanitarian Crisis Appeal where our federal government will match donations. So welcome, my name is Chris Markovic, CEO of PMA Breath Realty Group. On behalf of PMA, CIBC, our title sponsor, and our media partner, McHewitt. We are thrilled to have you all join us. I'm pleased to introduce Andy Brether, who will bring us up to speed with a quick, some quick remarks, rather, on our market and where we are today. Andy, over to you. Hi, hi Chris. Um, okay, hey. Good morning, everyone. Great to be with you. I've got the colors of, of Ukraine on today, the, the yellow and blue and our solidarity with that incredible country. Uh, you know, Canada has the largest Ukrainian population outside of Ukraine in the world. 1.4 million Ukrainians came here 77 years ago, for the most part, after World War II and settled mostly in the West. Uh, Manitoba, Alberta, Edmonton, Winnipeg, etc. But what an amazing people they are and what an incredible resilience against this battle uh, to protect their freedoms and, uh, and their democracy. Uh, and as Chris has mentioned, please reach out and support them if you can in any way, shape, form. Uh, we will be about to welcome tens of thousands of refugees. Uh, it's our hope in the next uh, coming months and uh, it'll be very, very important that we support that all the way through our infrastructure. It's an amazing and fearsome uh, element that's happening in our world as we sit here in the joy of freedom here in Canada to sit and discuss real estate issues uh, uh, while a war rages across the world. It's, um, it's a kind of a strange juxtaposition at this moment in time. But I urge you all to protect our freedoms. It's, it's fleeting. It can pass in a moment. Uh, and the people of Ukraine need your help. Uh, another area is the Abraham Global Peace Initiative, which I'm on their board of governors, agpi.com, uh, and they're doing major support both in moving refugees from Ukraine uh, as well as uh, assistance to those people right now in Ukraine. So uh, please reach out. Now, how about freedom of high rise? That's really what we're gonna be talking about today. And we've got a fabulous panel, uh, which I'm very excited about. Uh, you know, the interesting part about this is that in 2005, the growth plan introduced by McGinty set out a new direction for development in Ontario. Uh, we fondly called it intensification. Some of us called it the no growth plan uh, because it really called for a shift away from uh, not going out, but going up. And as a result, we, it, it, we created a uh, massive shift uh, of higher density uh, product within our urban areas, uh, mostly in the major urban cities of centers such as Toronto and GTA, which we'll be talking about today. The unintended consequence of this shift, because it worked, it worked dramatically. In 2005, we had uh, 25,000 low-rise development uh, uh, sales in the 
in the in and around 416905 and about 13,000 high rise. Now today in 2022, 17 years later, that has flipped completely, completely flipped. Uh, 25 to 30,000 high rise sales, uh, 13 to 15,000 new home sales, and or leaves low rise sales. And so you've seen this this uh, government by decree action has actually worked. Now the unintended consequence of this was uh, of course a rapid price escalation. Uh, I was kind of shocked when I looked it up this morning of what the average price in 2005 was 17 years ago in the GTA. If you can imagine, many of you, I'll ask you to guess and you, you, won't, you won't get it, but it's, uh, it was $335,000 was the average sale price of all product in 2005. Um, uh, today, it's of course 1.3 million, four times the level of where we were 17 years ago. Condo followed the same pattern. Condo high rise uh, in 2005, we, we, uh, Winston, we should have all bought a, a whole bunch of Tridel product and just sat up. Probably you did. You probably were brilliant enough to do that. Uh, but it was $200,000 in 2005 and today, of course, $800,000. Four times the value of what we saw at that period at the beginning of the growth plan's introduction. So an unintended consequence of the constriction of supply and intensification was a dramatic uh, uplift in price. Today, Toronto has the dubious distinction of being passing Vancouver as the most expensive city in Canada and the dubious distinction of being number two in the world as the most unaffordable city. Uh, this is not a great label to wear. It's something we're gonna to have to deal with in a big broader scale on the provision of supplies as we go forward. Uh, right now we're, uh, we've passed at 800 grand for an average condo price in the GTA. We, we passed the affordability quotient uh, and, and, and have pushed what, what had been our most affordable product uh, past the average uh, household income in Toronto. So we're now underwater in terms of that direction. And perhaps you're seeing that in, from the investor market as well, who has been underwater for a while, but looks at the equity appreciation as his long-term investment return. So here we enter into this market now in, in, um, in 2022, and I'll describe it as a first half, second half year. The first half is likely to continue along the same kind of pattern, the same pace. Uh, as rates increase, interest rates increase a little bit, you'll begin to uh, uh, constrict the, the uh, affordability side and you'll have a market that will be continuing strong as I jump in ahead of rate movement. That's already happening. What's interesting is just you know, as a sidebar is that the, the US Federal Reserve bumped rates uh, 25 basis points just as we did, but the movement of mortgage rates in the US was 35% higher than what happened in our world. Ours just barely moved. Uh, the banks did it in, in anticipation of the rate move. And you saw maybe a 50 basis point movement in interest rates in Canada on mortgages. But in US, uh, that same quarter point move pushed mortgages up 125 basis points, 35% more in carrying cost. So it's, a, it's an interesting evolution as we go. And that's why the, by the second half, we may see a little softer market a market that's facing price fatigue, a market that's facing a uh, pushback on inflation and, and the strain on qualifying to get into that, uh, what, what was once our most affordable product. And two other factors are, are creeping up on us. One, uh, a continuing push on demand of 450,000 new immigrants now will be entering into Canada per year over the next several years. It's scaled up, but it'll go as high as 460. Uh, this is our engine of growth under underneath uh, it, and of course, then we have a a uh, very interesting application of inclusionary zoning on September the 18th. Uh, so here's an evolution that will be placed upon the building development industry. I mean, they've been dealing with it now for a couple of years, trying to understand how to make it work. And uh, but by September 18th, it's official, and any projects in the pipe will have to deal with that at that moment in time. Uh, will that further constrict supply? Probably. And uh, therefore the second half, not nearly as buoyant as the first half. And then secondarily, it will be announced today by the province, uh, action being taken by the province through 
uh, what was the warranty program is now uh, you know, housing uh, protectorate. And the, uh, they will announce today a policy change on severe penalties for builders canceling projects or outreaching on uh, looking for increased pricing to try to cover what has been some dramatic inflationary cost push. So uh, that, this is going to affect high rise significantly. And maybe only the tip of the iceberg, as we've seen you know, in three or four projects in the last several months that have either canceled or attempted to secure significantly more dollars from the consumer before closing. And that's going to be a bit of, a, of an elephant in the room as the province announces penalties and a process to review uh, uh, such a thing. So uh, that's ahead of us. And and uh, and I think what we've been just recently experienced a bit of the tip of the iceberg, as I said, in terms of projects that will be in some significant difficulty because of the cost push on hards and softs over this last several months. So that's the story as we go into it. The first half is going to continue along just nicely, very similar to where we have been. Uh, and the second half uh, kind of, uh, as uh, I've said before, the only thing predictable about it is its unpredictability. I sense that interest rates may not move up as quickly as has been generally targeted. Uh, both the Federal Reserve in the US because of the US elections in the fall uh, will be much more careful and the Bank of Canada will be sensitive to uh, maintaining economic uh, stimulus. So you're gonna see a little bit slower pace, which is a good thing. Uh, any rapid movement in rates uh, will escalate mortgage rates higher and of course uh, put a greater damper uh, or the protection or the potential for any kind of reversal or correction in our market. Uh, none of that will happen until 2023, but uh, in the interim, uh, good luck, good selling, uh, happy building. Let's hope you can deliver. Let me turn it over to Grace Poon, our Director of Research, and Grace will moderate this session with uh, some several excellent contributors. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andy, and welcome, and thank you for joining us today for an exciting edition of the Summit. My name again is Grace Poon, and I am the Director of Research uh, for Southern Ontario, and I am thrilled to moderate this session and mostly so great to connect with colleagues for such a great discussion we have planned for you all, uh, for you all today. To help us unpack and explore and understand where design is headed, we are joined today by four amazingly accomplished industry leaders to provide us with some of their insights. So we are very fortunate to have uh, speakers who have spe specialized in residential developments, such as high-rise condos or multi-unit residential purpose-built rentals, as well as commercial, specifically office high-rise. So let's start. We have Badr Al-Khatib, who is the partner and SVP of acquisitions from Santa Court. Badr, why don't you introduce yourself? Thanks, Grace. And good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Badr Al-Khatib. Partner and senior vice president here at Center Court. Um, I've been with Center Court for five years and have uh, been active in the residential real estate market for for some time. Uh, uh, longer than that, I'm not going to show my cards. Um, at Center Court, we focus on high-rise residential in the GTA, with a primary focus on the downtown core. Um, our current portfolio consists of 22 uh, high-rise developments, 10 of which are completed, and 12 of which are in the various stages of pre-sales and construction. Um, we're very fortunate to have sold six buildings over the course of COVID um, and, and uh, hopefully shed some light as to what the high-rise downtown market looks like today. Thank you, Vader. Uh, next, we have Cash Prashutin, who is the founder and CEO of Emblem Developments. Cash? Thank you, Grace. It's, uh, it's good to be with you today. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Emblem Developments. Uh, we are a mid-rise and high-rise residential developer here in the GTA. We focus really right across the GTA. We have projects in Mississauga, Hamilton, um, downtown Toronto, uh, really all over, extending as far as Ottawa, uh, where we have four projects. Currently, um, over the next 12 months, uh, we will be bringing uh, over uh, 3,000 units to, uh, to market, um, again, spread out all over uh, the GTA market. 
And um, really for Emblem, we have a real distinct focus on design. Um, when you look at Emblem product, you could see that there really is an obsession with design from the outside of the building to the inside of the building. Whether we're designing a building in the suburbs or right downtown Toronto, we put that emphasis on design and, and design based on our brand as opposed to the market that we're in. Oh, that's amazing. Looking forward to hear some more of your, of your insights. Uh, next up is Winston Chan, who is the VP of Sales and Development from Tridel. Winston? Hi. Um, excited to see everyone. I'm Winston Chan. I'm the Vice President of Sales Development for Tridel. And uh, Tridel, we had been in the business for the past 87 uh, years, 87,000 home builds. Um, we are privileged and excited to share this uh, uh, opinion and uh, experience with uh, a lot of panels here too. Uh, Tridel also will be uh, actively bringing a project uh, this year. Uh, the first one would be in, in downtown. There's also exciting project coming in, in uh, Mississauga as well too. Uh, once again, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Excited to learn from everyone today. Thank you, Winston. And then to nicely round out this discussion, I reached out to a colleague of mine from my past life in commercial real estate, Shakar Bart Bardwaj, uh, who is the Toronto Office Leasing Research Manager from CBRE. Shakar. Thank you, Grace. So my name is Shakar Bardwaj, and I'm the Research Manager at CBRE Downtown. I lead the local research department and support office leasing and sales. Routinely, I'll publish research reports and periodic st statistics trying to uncover the drivers of activity along with emerging trends. And it's been interesting doing that since the start of the pandemic, to say the least. Thank you, Shakar. So panelists, let's get started and uh, start the show. Uh, I hate to jinx anything, uh, but it seems like we're at what it seems to be the tail end of the pandemic. So let's talk about how we managed through the last uh, past two years. Uh, we heard about the migration of so many home buyers shifting to smaller communities, to smaller town Ontario, Cottage country because they could. So using the five W's line of inquiry, uh, where did you notice the most significant impact? Is it in your traffic count, sales volumes? What did you do to combat this trend? When did you pivot your strategies or did you do any of that? Who did you find were buying in the more suburban locations? Was it uh, more of the high rise buyers? And why did you thrive and succeed over the others? So why don't we start the conversation uh, with uh, batter. Sure thing, and it's, it's a pretty loaded question, so I'm going to try and be, uh, uh, I guess, precise here. Um, you know, I'm putting myself back in, uh, you know, my seat in, I guess, March 2020 when COVID was first kind of uh, making headlines, and um, you know, we shut down the office and everybody was working from home. And I think what we did at Center Court, which is probably, um, you know, in hindsight, uh, the right thing is we just stuck to really what the data was telling us um, and, and what we uh, knew about, I guess, high rise development and, and economics. Uh, we have very strong conviction in the Toronto housing market. We think Toronto is the most appealing place for talent, for people, for education uh, in the world right now and has been for multiple years. Um, so that conviction uh, certainly uh, was unwavering. Um, so what we did uh, was we certainly took a pause uh, to understand what COVID uh, was going to do to our business. Um, I would say that pause lasted for a period of uh, you know two to three months as, as we understood what the risks were. Uh, but I'm proud to say that we closed on all of our land transactions that were contemplated for that year, and there was at least three large ones. Um, and we proceeded with sales actually in July of in July of 2020 with our first downtown launch at 199 Church. What did we see though that was different? I think when you think of real estate, real estate's a long-term business. People who buy real estate are typically in it for um, a medium to a long-term investment horizon. And so when you look at our sales cycles and who was buying, I would say that folks who are seasoned investors, who, you know, this is not their first time buying, um, you know, a single family, sorry, um, you know, they bought the single family home. This is not their first time buying a investment product condo. Um, they knew that the downtown would reemerge. And actually, I would say they were looking for bargains. They were bargain hunting. Uh, for a first time in a long time, they had their pick of the litter in terms of units, in terms of uh, views, in terms of a whole host of things. Uh, so we actually saw some significant demand. Was it equal to pre-COVID? Certainly not. 
but that changed quickly. I would say by early 2021, uh, the sentiment had changed. People understood that the work from home phenomenon uh, was gonna work for some, but not for all. And that people always typically go back and follow long-term trends. And the long-term trend is people wanna be close to other people, people wanna work with other people, people wanna walk to the office, be close to amenities. And I think we're seeing that now more than ever as the city is you know, more or less officially open for business. Perfect. <clears throat> Sorry. Perfect. Thank you so much for that matter. Uh, before I get cash to jump in, uh, for the audience, you can put in your questions in the Q&A spot at the bottom of your screen, uh, and we will do our best to get to those questions uh, probably towards the end of the session. Please feel free to answer in that Q&A spot uh, at the bottom of your screen. Sorry, Cash, you know, your thoughts on, on the questions? Certainly, yeah. Um... Our experience at Emblem over the last uh, two years, uh, I'm happy to share. Um, what we what we ex we launched three projects over the last approximately 18 months. It represented about 1,100 suites, and um, we've had very strong sales velocity. We're essentially sold all 1,100 suites. We've we've held back maybe a, a handful, uh, high single digits. So, for discussion purposes, you could say that over 18 months we sold 1,100 suites. What's interesting or notable about that is that those sales all took place in suburban markets. Uh, two of those projects were in Mississauga, one was in Hamilton. And for us at Emblem, from a investment perspective, we believe that there's, they're, they're less so now, but when we started three, four years ago, looking at the comparables from suburb to downtown, we believe that there's a real dis dislocation between the price of downtown Toronto and the suburbs. 10 out of 10 people will agree that downtown Toronto is where most of the jobs are, most of the best restaurants are, the buzz is downtown Toronto. And as a result, it should be worth more. But when you look at investments, it's really about how much more. And when that gap is too wide, there's generally an arbitrage opportunity. And so for us, the investment, the significant investment we've made on the suburbs happened to work out well with the timing of COVID and a move to the suburbs. But we feel that the opportunity from a demand perspective would have been there regardless of COVID. And it's really predicated on the disconnect between the price of uh, per square foot sales downtown Toronto compared to the suburbs. So our sales velocity was very strong and, and COVID certainly helped. Um, out of those three projects, one of them sold 90% in four weeks, one sold 90% in three weeks, and one of the projects sold out entirely 354 suites in 48 hours. So certainly we've seen significant velocity, but also increase in, uh, in price. On a go forward basis, we do believe that the return to office and really just everything opening up will certainly be opportunistic for downtown Toronto. In fact, we're, we're launching three buildings um, in the downtown area this year, uh, in the second half of this year. Um, but on a go forward basis, we see opportunity both in downtown Toronto and uh, in the suburbs. Um, the suburbs obviously continue to be more affordable and um, there's a lot of people that would like to live downtown Toronto, but unfortunately can't afford to. So with access to public transit in the suburbs, it's the next best thing. And we believe that we're gonna to continue to see growth in both downtown and in the suburbs. Perfect, no, thank you so much, Cash. And Winston, what did you, what's your take uh, from Tridel on the questions? Yeah, I think uh, COVID uh, kind of pivoted into a more efficient operation. You know, in terms of uh, the sales and demonstration and all that, we can easily move into virtual, just like uh, similar today, like way back when I uh, lined up to see uh, Andy talk and learn from him, and we have to go to the drive to uh, uh, a seminar location, a hotel to listen to him. Right now, we'll be able to enjoy this uh, seminar, listen to all the experts uh, right at your, your home. Um, same applied to our sales uh, process that has been quite efficient. Um, 
obviously we enjoy our fair share of sales success, but we also think that uh, uh, during the past two years, a lot of our purchaser really focus on our home. Uh, our home is not only our home anymore, it's our office, it's our resort, and now today, uh, uh, today is a central location of uh, uh, the PMA seminar. Uh, so uh, work from home, it's also uh, an interesting phenomenon. Uh, so the, people are focused more on, on the home choice. Now, uh, while in the home choice, uh, obviously a lot of people prefer, uh, could prefer to live in a detached home, but uh, the reality kicks in. Not many people be able to afford 1.5 million or even more in, in their vicinity. So that gives rise into a opportunity for condo as well too. Um, also, we are not dealing with discretionary purchase. A lot of people think that there is a lot of investor, but we, when I see in a day-to-day -day, uh, business too, they are purchasing for themselves. Perhaps they are smart sizing from the home. They cannot, uh, they cannot come back the stairs anymore. They need to smart size into a beautiful condominium. Uh, and then also they would become the bank of mom and dad to help, help that, uh, their son and daughter by, uh, purchasing the home. And uh, interestingly, while a lot of people talking about, uh, a lot of people move to, uh, you know, Muskoka and all this beautiful resort area. And I actually see reverse. I see a, um, uh, a lot of purchasers come back to purchase like a reverse mortgage, like an urban cottage, uh, because as um, Cash was mentioning, um, our uh, uh, downtown uh, urban core is amazing. A lot of uh, beautiful restaurant, a lot of uh, great amenities. Uh, those are still a good attraction. So end up they would like to have a uh, urban cottage in downtown while they, uh, uh, they are actually uh, enjoying the, the resort resident as well too. So those are some interesting observation that I have. Wonderful, thank you so much, uh, Winston for that. So great, so, well, let's start talking a little bit of office leasing. So Shakar, uh, your team's been on the forefront in Toronto and Toronto office leasing. So could you help us shed some light on what you've seen and dealt with over the past two years? So what trends did you start to see in the horizon as, um, as the pandemic unfolded? You know, what were, what were your occupiers and landlord clients telling you during the worst of times? And what are they telling you now? Yeah, so as the pandemic unfolded, the first trend that I saw was a sharp increase in sublease space. Now, this is where occupiers look to shed their space, or at least try to ascertain the value of their space in the sublease market. But it's worth noting that some of these initial moves were just to test the marketplace. Not all companies knew what was next in terms of the pandemic or their workplace strategy. The sublet market gave some businesses more information and allowed them to be more nimble in their decision-making. Now, as the pandemic continued, Many uh, built out turnkey spaces leased to occupiers who are looking beyond working from home, so more opportunistic occupiers. Also, as the confidence slowly returned to the market, the tenants realized that the sky was uh, in fact not falling. They pulled their space off the sublet market and they maintained their existing footprint. We saw several examples of that as well. In terms of uh, employee preferences, we've really seen the pendulum shift from a desire for a full remote to frustration with isolation and distractions at home, such as kids and pets. And now we have a fairly broad acceptance of a hybrid arrangement. Another trend that I saw, I like to call this one like a market within the market, right? So this was an increased demand towards class A space. Now, this was certainly a flight to quality where built out, centrally located, high quality space saw strong demand while lesser quality buildings felt the pressure to, um, improve their offerings. Um, to answer the second part of your question, uh, what the occupiers and landlord clients tell you during the worst of times, I think um, much like life, the experiences were varied. Generally, the larger uh, institutional occupiers felt less immediate financial pressure, and they were interested in gathering intel and information for long-term decisions. Some smaller, less established tenants really did feel the pinch, admittedly, and uh, they needed to uh, rationalize their space. Across the board, uh, I thought, uh, I felt that it was a very human experience. People were scared, but more importantly, people were there for one another, right? There's a lot of sharing, a lot of openness. And I think this will translate into deeper relationships as time goes on. You know, during the worst of times that landlord clients held firm in their belief in the office asset class, they insisted that uh, this too shall pass. And the office is a necessity towards productive work and uh, collaborative success. Um, we heard many stories of compassion from landlords uh, towards tenants, right? As their businesses dried up, given that the tenants were um, 
willing to share their financial statements. No, perfect. No, that's that's very true. And I think that's the, the key thing right now overall as a market, uh, residential or commercial, it's that whole passion and compassion for people. Uh, you know, a lot of tough times and it, you know, hopefully we're, we're rolling out of it, but that is a key word is to keep that compassion right through. Uh, so let's fast forward a little to January, 2022. Uh, we saw in January, 232% increased sales. And even in February from past February last year, 87.8% in increased sales in that pre-construction high rise, um, from the same that was a year ago. And more and more people are returning to the office as Shakar just mentioned, either through hybrid or full-time and downtown is coming back. Um, again, you know, why don't we start with cash? Emblem has been really active in some suburban markets. So far, well, we've been talking in downtown, Toronto, whereas your firm is highly invested outside of downtown. So why don't you tell us more about your experience surrounding this uptake in high rise What's driving it for you? <clears throat> Will you be revi uh, revising or altering acquisition strategies moving forward? Thanks, Grace. Yeah. Um, so look, I mean, my background, is, as some know, comes from 20 years in the investment management industry. And so we are wired as a firm on one sense to be very design focused, but on the other sense to be very um, investment focused. And so our move into the suburb markets, as I mentioned earlier, was really predicated on the opportunity we saw between the dislocation of pricing downtown compared to the suburbs. Again, everyone agrees downtown Toronto is more desirable for most than being in the suburbs for a variety of reasons from shorter transit times to access to more amenities. But again, you have to ask yourself, how much more is it, is it worth? And so we've seen downtown Toronto appreciate double digits for several years in, in the new condo space and the suburbs had really not caught up. So that gap was just way too wide in our view. And again, this had nothing to do with COVID. And so the bet that we've made is that although downtown Toronto with or without COVID continues to be a very strong, very attractive market, not only in Canada, but globally, there needs to be some catch up that, that's played for the suburb markets. And you've seen that, you know, when we launched, for example, our project in Hamilton uh, about a year and a half ago, or a little less than a year and a half ago, we sold at 750 a foot. That project sold out in 48 hours and it was higher price point than anything else that had sold in Hamilton by about 25%. So not only is the demand fueled the sales velocity, but you've seen buildings sell out in 48 hours at 25% higher than anything that's ever sold in that community before. And when you see that, it speaks to not only a strong market and demand, but also the fact that that neighborhood, that community was undervalued. We saw similar uh, price patterns in areas of Mississauga that, um, that we focused on. So um, moving forward here, we continue to look at all markets, downtown Toronto um, certainly being a part of that. And we're big believers in downtown Toronto. I mean, the fact is in downtown Toronto, you're paying for your building and the amenities and the suite, but a big part of what you're paying for is the energy. You know, you're paying for the energy, you're paying for um, the interaction, you're, you're paying for a lot that's not physical um, and tangible, but that has a significant value. And as the economy starts to open up and as we, we start to live life, like more so how we knew before COVID, we're going to see the appreciation for that energy and that non-tangible um, component really come back to play. And we're already seeing that. So that's lined up well with our strategy in terms of coming to market. And as I mentioned, this year, we're going to be bringing three buildings to market um, in the downtown core area in, uh, in Toronto. And we feel that it lines up well with when the appreciation is coming back, like I said, for the non-tangible parts, which is, uh, which is the energy and the access and the lifestyle. Perfect, thank you. And we're looking forward to those three projects. Uh, Winston, how about you? Uh, what are you, are you seeing this equally uh, happening between center ice locations versus some of your projects in the outlying areas? Um, so if you could tell us about your balance between downtown projects and uh, projects that you're doing in say Thornhill or Mississauga in those outskirts, like how is that looking? 
Yeah, we are, uh, have uh, a big population here in Toronto, and our market is actually quite diverse. So uh, downtown, obviously, there is a lot of uh, support or two, but also, uh, like, say, our project, like in Fawn Hill, Royal Bayview, uh, Etobicoke, uh, at Etobicoke, we have uh, Eden Bridge and, and even uh, some other North York location. And I uh, think the matter is since our market is so diverse and then say when you wanted to buy a condominium, uh, you want to smart size your condominium. If you live in Etobicoke, you would like to be say in the same area. Uh, same likewise for Thorn Hill and then uh, downtown too. Uh, and downtown, not only you are uh, uh, buying a condominium too, uh, you be able to actually enjoy all the amenities that kind of uh, come with it, the, the convenience, uh, the excitement, the major league sports and all that too. And I think also why drive the uh, the market to this level, it's also thanks to the resale market. The resale buying experience may not be the most present, but they're all uh, driven by emotion, uh, emotional, a lot of bidding wars and all that too. Uh, one solution to that is to go to pre-construction our, our price are fixed and there's not too much uh, bidding war you need to go through and you be, uh, be able to uh, uh, find a location you like and then you offer a little bit more choice as well too. So um, I, I definitely see the excitement coming back. Perfect. Uh, we're all excited about it too, just to, to get this market moving again. Batter, on the flip side, you must be enjoying some of this relief rebound at Center Court. I mentioned you Having been in the trenches with so much on your, of your investments in the 416, is, an, is that an accurate statement? And now that it's back, looking in hindsight, what decisions or actions did you take that work to try to limit uh, any of those exposures? Uh, and of course, of those, uh, those actions that you guys took at Center Court, what worked and what didn't work? Yeah, absolutely, Grayson. Yeah, I would say that, you know, uh, the Toronto market didn't necessarily come back just in January 2022. Um, you know, we've been launching projects in the downtown core um, since July of 2020, uh, all of which have been extremely well received, hitting record pricing and selling out quite quickly. Um, you know, two examples I'll share with you is our you know, A Wellesley project at uh, Young and Wellesley. You know, uh, we had a very similar experience at the Cash Emblem. Um, 600 units sold out within a week. Um, our, five two, our 252 project over at Church and Dundas was the first downtown launch um, of 2022. A 52-story building, 681 units sold out. Um, I would say at record pricing all within 10 days. Um, so what we have clearly seen is a demand from from investors, from buyers, from students, from uh, newcomers uh, to want to be uh, in the downtown core. Um, I think what you uh, are witnessing now is a bit of pent up demand. And that pent up demand is a function of candidly a, a fewer launches in 2020 and 2021. Um, people in the real estate world are not necessarily just looking to write a check and, and buy anywhere. As, as Winston said, you know, you're, you're really looking for um, that product in the right area. And as, you know, as cash experience in Hamilton, if, if, you, if there hasn't been a new development, a new launch in a couple of years, and people really want to be in that node, this is now their option. This is their opportunity. Who knows how many more years they have to wait. And I think Toronto, downtown in particular, is one that um, is, is a market that's constrained. So there's going to be less and less choices. So what you're seeing here is, Partly a function of pent-up demand, partly a function of COVID, but partly a function of lesser choice. Um, you know, you asked me what would I have done differently the last couple of years? Probably buy more land. Um, you know, we were in a very volatile market, so it was really hard to predict where, you know, the, uh, well, where, certainly where sales pricing was going, where construction costs are going. Um, it's very difficult to underwrite sites today, um, particularly when you overlay inclusionary zoning and uh, municipal charge increases. There's a, there's a lot of unknowns in our business. But one of the things I would have done differently is probably, uh, uh, you know, tried to have acquired a, a few more properties, particularly in the downtown. Um, now, I would balance that off with uh, affordability. The downtown is hitting a, a price point, which is out of reach for, for a lot of people. So despite how attractive it is, it's just practically uh, not an option for a significant segment of, of buyers out there. 
No, perfect. No, thank you. Thank you for that insight, Bader. Um, Shakar, in the commercial sphere, uh, we've heard about the volumes of subleases, uh, lapsed contracts, rented rent arrears, or occupies asking for a reduced footprint. Uh, what is the new post-pandemic desired office space configuration nowadays? And is it more open spaces or smaller offices or even like we work spaces? Like what is what is that desire and what is really happening? And are there any hot areas for new leases and office spaces that uh, you can share with us? Of course, of course. So I'll answer that question in two parts. So while it's true that during the pandemic, many tenants right-sized their space due to an anticipated drop in density, many occupiers, particularly in the tech sector, as you may have heard, have doubled down on their office needs. So some great examples of this is Facebook or Meta, which leased uh, 130,000 square feet at 16 New York, Amazon 130,000 square feet at 18 New York, 120 Bremner, Lastly, our very own uh, SCORE Media, this deal was done by CBRE, took about 90,000 square feet at 125 Queens Key East. So the amount of space being leased now is higher than before the pandemic, partly due to an increased vacancy. And in fact, November of 2021 was one of the best leasing months on record. So overall, the trend for now is good, but now it's about who is driving the market and how the space is being used. That's the thing that will vary. Trend is solid. Um, you also mentioned sublease recoveries. I believe they're fairly high, at least in terms of class A space throughout the pandemic, the recoveries are fairly high. But to answer the second part of your question, I think centrally located space, such as space located in the financial core and greater core will continue to be in demand. And I also think the waterfront area or downtown South is making a name for itself. In terms of the type of space, we're seeing a desire for more open workplaces with a focus on both meeting rooms, as well as individual breakout rooms and away from a traditional cubicle setting. Amazing, no, thank you. Thank you so much for that insight. Um, okay. Well, with interest rates on the rise, a very real supply crisis and inflation now at its highest since, highest level since 91 uh, and current events around the world that affects so many of us right now, right here at home. I wanna to switch uh, to more of a forward looking line of conversation. Um, land, as we know, is in the core is getting harder and harder uh, to acquire. And the runway to bring a new community in Ontario is a daunting 10 years, as we know. So in your view, what needs to happen? Winston, what are your thoughts on that very quickly? Uh, demand, I think, uh, through the past half an hour, we kind of uh, confirmed that the demand is there. And I think our challenge is uh, supply. Uh, imminent 400,000 people coming in, 100,000 will be settling in here too. Uh, immigration means nothing without education and opportunity. And uh, echo to what uh, Sheka was, was presenting the possibly new to us too. What currently driving market is the uh, employment opportunity and education opportunity. They come here for needs, they need to leave there. Um, so uh, on top of, of those organization too, recently you hear about uh, Walmart, the innovation center coming here to Netflix headquarters, IBM garage and all that too. All this a good news story. And I, our current challenge is supply. Like right now we have over 200 cranes in the city of Toronto, but then uh, would we be able to fulfill the demand? And COVID is not over yet, and restriction is not 100% over. Uh, incoming so immigrants, students, and the potential worker back to, to the downtown, that will be uh, uh, interesting uh, to see in the future. Amazing. How about you, Batter? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, you know, I couldn't agree with Winston more. And, and really, your point, like, of how long it takes to bring on a new building. Um, it's truly um, astounding when you see buildings go up in other cities, in, whether in North America or abroad, and at the pace at which they move relative to uh, the pace at which we move. And it's a shame because uh, there's so many great Canadian real estate companies, right? Uh, I think people forget that uh, we're truly home to some of the largest uh, you know, powerhouses, whether it's in the commercial office or residential space. Um, across the world, uh, but somehow in our own backyard, we're, we're, we're stuck in the mud. Um, so, you know, I think it's a combination of, yes, land is hard to come by, um, but that's also a function of policy, right? Because not every piece of land is developable. Um, it takes a very long time to bring units online. That's also a function of policy. Now, I'm not saying those policies are wrong, but I think they need to be tweaked. They need to be... Um, there's certain things that need to be prioritized 
given the crisis that we're, we're going through. I think uh, for a lot of young professionals, people starting families, new immigrants here, um, Toronto's a fantastic place to be um, and people want to be here, but we need to make that dream possible. And I think right now it's very difficult. And we have a lot of folks who are um, you know, truly dissuaded uh, from setting long-term roots in our city. Um, that's it's very true. Uh, and Cash, anything, any, any differing thoughts uh, or any of your own thoughts on that? Our view at Emblem is, is uh, certainly land is, as, as you point out, scarce and, and becoming more and more scarce. But in terms of affordability and supply, uh, land is really just one piece of the equation. Um, as developers know, uh, when you bring a building or a project, uh, the price you pay for the land, how long it takes to assemble it is one component. But um, as other panelists and, and Batter just pointed out, um, the process that you go through after you uh, acquire or assemble the land is equally, if not, more influential in determining A, if you do the project and B, how long it takes for that project to become a new home for existing Canadians or new Canadians that have come here. So if we're, if we're looking at supply in the future, it's like most things that are meaningful in life. You cannot look at one component in isolation um, without considering the other pieces and policy would certainly be a big part of that. Um, fees would be a part of that. Just the overall development process needs to be examined and not because developers are asking for it to be, but if our effort, if our push is to bring more supply online and we're concerned that a big part of that is the scarcity in land, we're really missing the ball. There's, there's a lot of other components. Um, we can't create more land, uh, but there are several um, actions that we can take after it's well considered within the overall development process that would help achieve our overall goal of providing more housing that have nothing to do with land. Perfect. Uh, anyone can jump in on this one. What about infl uh, inflationary pressures and supply chain issues? I know that every one of you have touched on it slightly. Um, who wants to tell me about their very real experience dealing with supply chain and rising construction cost issues? So, Grace, maybe I can uh, sure. share a little bit on that. Um, you know, so, at Center Court, uh, we have an in house construction manager. Um, so, we self perform uh, our construction. Um, currently, we have nine uh, buildings under construction uh, in various stages. And what I have to say is, in, I think I just touched on this briefly, previously, but how difficult it is to underwrite today because of the volatility. Um, we are seeing unprecedented increases in line items um, in the construction budget, um, not quarter by quarter, but month by month. And it becomes extremely difficult to uh, peg a price on, on, on construction. It also becomes extremely difficult to define qualified trades to actually build uh, your building. So even if you can find somebody at a price that's acceptable, now finding them uh, with the right uh, labor, the right personnel, the right oversight, people you have confidence are going to uh, build this building uh, for your purchasers um, in a timely fashion uh, to a high quality, that's a whole nother challenge. So it's as much as there is concern about the cost piece, there's also concern about timelines. Even if you're willing to pay, when can you actually get a crane up, a shovel in the ground, and a building going? And I think that is, um, you know, I would say a challenge that I'm, I'm sure everybody on this call is dealing with um, daily, if not weekly. No, that's, that's perfect. Uh, Winston, Cash, any input on it? Uh, sure, maybe I can uh, jump in. Uh, uh, echo to uh, uh, that I was uh, saying too. Uh, yes, our, our in-house team uh, basically is our 
local hero because not only they have to deal with the COVID challenge, um, you know, supply chain issue, and also they have to deal with the logistic challenge. If you have a certain material, you're looking for a certain material that's not available, when there are certain material available, then you have to get your worker to come in on top. I have to deal with all this uh, COVID uh, protocol. So, and I, I think uh, the challenge is even more and more moving forward. Amazing. Yeah, I would just add that um, scale for, for, for us as a developer, um, having scale has, has been helpful in the past, but um, moving forward and even in the present term, having scale is almost a necessity um, unless you're doing multiple buildings. Uh, we have right now, uh, I believe eight, buildings under construction and that, you know, you need that kind of scale, if not greater to be able to arm wrestle, um, uh, trades, you know, and, and, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's harder to get the attention of trades. They're just so busy. There's a shortage of everything, uh, materials, uh, people, labor. Um, and so, um, scale is, is one way to combat some of these pressures because, um, the trades that you're working with will look at your building as one building in a collection of buildings that they're, they're doing with you. Um, and so it, it, it makes you a, a bigger priority. I think um, for developers that are just coming into the industry that don't have the scale, it's going to be very, very challenging. I mean, it always has. High rise is, has a high barrier to entry, but I think in this market, it's, it's almost impossible unless you have scale. No, perfect. Um, well, let's approach the elephant in the room then, shall we? Uh, what are your thoughts on the increase of land tax, new fees, the change in inclusionary zoning, the different restrictions and obstacles, and how does this affect affordability? And as developers, what's lost in translation to the consumers? What do they need to know? And what are their concerns that we can address um, to the group here? Um, why don't we start with uh, you know, cash here on my screen still? So cash, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, look, I think whether you're talking about personal income tax or, or tax that has to do with buildings, I mean, any, any fee that we're paying, um, you know, our view at Emblem is we're happy to pay fees and we're happy to pay an increase in fees. There needs to just be a, a clear game plan of what those fees um, are going to be used for and how that's going to benefit the, the goals and the initiatives that government has set out. Um, and I think that that accountability is what we expect from anybody and everybody that we deal with day to day, whether it's spending $5 or it's spending $50 million. So um, we have no issues with, with uh, the fees and, and increase in fees. Um, really where we sort of find it challenging is that there isn't always a clear path on what those fees are going to be used for and how it's going to benefit um, the goals and the initiatives that have been set out. Um, one of those is primarily affordability. Um, so further transparency on that, I think would be, would be helpful. And not only that, but it would, I think, make it a little bit less combative between the two sides, between developers and, and sometimes, um, governments that are asking for it. And it can create a platform where it becomes a lot more collaborative and, and, um, and mutually, uh, beneficial, but as it stands now, we all know there's uh, surpluses sitting that's of dollars that are not being allocated. And, um, you know, the other side of it too, is it doesn't take a forensic investigation to see that as these fees are introduced, pretty much all of them are just passed down to the consumer because otherwise the building can't get built. So if we're trying to make buildings and, and accessing and the ability to buy a home more affordable, sometimes these fees do more harm than good. Perfect. And how about you, Batter? Your thoughts on that? I think Cash did a really good job of, of really summarizing it there. The, the only piece maybe that I'd layer on here is just um, clarity, right? Knowing something is coming. Um, people, I think, sometimes forget that, you know, as, as developers, we're, we're effectively built, we're building to a margin. And that's why a lot of these fees do get passed along. It's because we're trying to keep our margins intact. In and those margins are important because you need to go get bank financing to build these buildings and the bank want to make sure that they're lending to a viable project. So there's, there's a whole lot of reasons for them. So I think when you see an uproar from the development community, typically it's not because there's an apprehension to pay um, our fair share for growth. It's because we're caught off guard. Um, so certainly that's very important. 
Um, but the other piece is a tool like inclusionary zoning. You know, I completely appreciate and understand the need for affordable housing. Um, I'm someone who, when we immigrated to this country, you know, 30 some odd years ago, uh, we lived in affordable housing. So it was extremely, um, you know, it was a platform that we needed to set up our lives. And, uh, you know, I am where I am today because of that opportunity. So I certainly want to add to that stock, but I don't think that taxing the other 93% of condo buyers or home buyers, um, strapping them with the, you know, uh, the weight of providing that resource to the community is, is fair. Um, if you look at other municipalities uh, across North America, there's a different way of doing it. Um, so for me, I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that we're going to get this thing right. I don't think it's going to work in the very first instance. I think it's going to lead to, to higher home pricing. Um, out of the gate, but I'm hopeful that we can figure out and, uh, you know, lend our expertise to the affordability crisis. We need to build more. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that this inclusionary zoning policy is going to be seen as almost another barrier uh, to that and uh, have an adverse effect. Uh, that makes sense, too. And how about you, Winston, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think uh, they all, uh, all the panelists cover uh, the important aspect of this uh, issue. Uh, what I wanted to summarize it is uh, is the clarity, and I think the consumer need to understand. While you see the 20, 30 percent, or maybe even 40 percent increase, uh, it is not builder managing the profits, builder managing the cost, the risk management. You know, the supply chain issue and all the taxes uh, that is incoming, and then uh, also a lot of people forgot our price include the HSD as well too. So that part is certain that was uh, being taken care of. Um, so moving forward, costs uh, would be an issue. Oh, great. Thank you, uh, Winston. So back to Shakar uh, to kind of round this up. What do you see happening in the office sector? Um, what are some of the similar or different challenges uh, that you see in the future uh, that may or may not, uh, you know, talk to or speak to what your panelists have mentioned already? So I'll pivot a little bit and speak on some of the challenges affecting the office asset class. First off, I would agree with the, the panelists with respect to the supply glut. In downtown Toronto, we have nearly 8 million square feet of uh, office product, which is expected to come online in the next three to four years. But right now we have a more balanced market. The office market has certainly seen a reversion to the mean and with the current vacancy of around 10%, give or take you know, 10, 20 basis points in downtown Toronto, the landlord's market of 2019 with a 2% vacancy feels distant, to say the least. Tenants now have more negotiating leverage compared to pre-COVID. Landlords must now compete on quality, location, as well as space offerings and amenities, as everyone is trying to um, attract these high-quality, well-capitalized tenants. Bringing people back to the office can seem daunting, but what I personally believe is in the next 12 to 24 months, employees will see the value of face-to-face -face communication, and how visibility affects networking as well as career progression. Employers seem to be most successful when they're not compelling people, but encouraging them to come back to the office. And with that, we may see FOMO kick in when we reach a critical mass in the downtown cores. And it'll be different for all players involved, but uh, I think we're kind of moving away from that centralized model that we've been following uh, for all these years. No, that's good. No, thank, thank you for that insight from the office side too. So with all the, seems like a, a more negative or all about the challenges and obstacles, why don't we look at the flip side of this and what are some of the good news uh, with the market ahead? Uh, batter, you. Yeah, no, we, we talked a lot of the challenge, but um, look, the good news is this. Uh, there is a very buoyant um, employment market right now. Uh, for the first time in a long time, I think there's uh, more opportunities than there are uh, employees to fill those roles. Uh, we're seeing wage growth, uh, which has stagnated in the city of Toronto for, for some time. So I think overall, that is a bright spot here, um, bringing people up to an ability where uh, hopefully affordability is no longer a substantial uh, challenge like it is today. Thank you. And uh, Cash, your thoughts? Um, the market continues to be strong. You know, at the end of the day, we can complain um, all we want, and we probably will find something to complain about. But let's face it, the market is strong. 
Uh, the buyers are high quality, they're well qualified, they're domestic. And, um, and so certainly there's some challenges to work through. Um, but net net, demand continues to be very strong. And when you look at what Toronto looked like five years ago, and you look at what it looks like today, it's something to really be proud of. And as a developer, we're very excited to be contributing to what Toronto will look like five years from now. And so um, net net, there's a lot to be positive about, a lot to be happy about, a lot to be proud uh, about as, as all of us are contributing to the future of uh, this amazing city. So, um, you know, we're, let's leave with a smile on our face. <laughs> no, absolutely. Looking forward to all the changes. And Winston, how about you and Tridel? What's what's happening and the positivity of that? Yeah, uh, we're excited about the market. The market is strong and resilient. Uh, we can kind of witness it in, in the COVID time. And uh, incoming immigration, employment opportunity, education opportunity, education opportunity. We have over 42 different uh, quality post-secondary education opportunity. And we're welcoming over half a million foreign students coming to Canada. So I think all this uh, immigration, uh, it will be a, a positive story moving forward. Thank you. Shakar? Yeah, so I think the office as a class is very resilient and the peak of the vacancy will be in 2022. Um, as many of you know, there's been considerable pre-leasing by the big five banks in the new bills which are going up, such as uh, 160 front, CRBC square. And as a result, these large uh, financial occupiers will be giving back space, causing the vacancy to further increase. That being said, as I alluded to earlier, occupiers in the technology and creative services realm such as Meta, Skip the Dishes, DoorDash, continue to drive positive absorption. And that trend is expected to continue moving forward. The percentage of sublease vacancy as a share of overall vacancy peaked at around 43% in Q2 2021. It has then subsequently dropped. I think a similar situation will occur with uh, overall vacancy as leasing continues and occupancy levels increase. So the good news is lower vacancy and more positive absorption. Thank you. I love how we ended off this on a positive note uh, and something definitely to look forward to the future. And, you know, we all hope and it seems like we're, we're trending in the right way. Uh, we are looking at a better market. Things are going well. Things are starting, if not already fully open for some some businesses and markets. So fingers crossed, uh, you know, this is a continuance and uh, no more lockdowns. Uh, I want to thank you, the, thank the panelists for an incredibly interesting and stimula a sim stimulating discussion. Uh, I believe the questions that came in, we've answered most of it throughout uh, the discussion. There is one that I would love to bring through to the panelists and you know jump in whoever wants to start. Uh, but one of the questions was, how concerned are the pa are the panel panelists? about catering condo sales to investors who may walk on their deposits if there is a significant market correction and what percentage of your purchasers are in fact investors. So I'll leave it up to, you know, Better Cash Winston to, to uh, take the lead on it. I'll take it. Um, so look, there, there's no question that every condo, unless it's a boutique, condo with, you know, let's say 40, 50 suites, the majority of condos do have a high percentage of investors buying them. That's just fact. Um, what's important to, to note as you dig deeper into that is that those, Can those investors are Canadian um, and they're not foreign investors for the most part. I mean, I can speak for Emblem Projects. We don't have any foreign investors in our projects. So, the capital is sticky, the, the, it's, it's, it's individuals and families that are here. And these are people that are often investing in pre-construction as an alternative to investing in the stock market. So they're not speculators, they're investors, and this is part of their retirement strategy as Canadians. So from that perspective, does it de-risk it completely? No, I mean, there, there isn't an answer to that. Um, but in terms of how investors are thinking about it, it's really important to distinguish if it's foreign investors or, uh, or, or domestic investors. And we're seeing that come from domestic investors. The demand is there. You know, we've talked a lot about immigration on this call. And when you have 400,000 plus new entrants into Canada, 
Some of them are buying condos, some of them are buying homes, but if they're not buying condos um, or homes, they're renting. And they're often renting from those investors that have purchased in pre-construction. So the immigration story is really important, not only because necessarily they're all, you know, new families are coming here and all buying suites, but many of them are coming here and renting from Canadian investors that have put money into pre-construction condos. So there's two takeaways. One, the investors are domestic. Uh, I mean, in our buildings anyways, but I, I believe that's the case um, across the board for most. The investors are domestic. And the second is that immigration fuels demand not only for new home and new condo sales, but certainly for rentals as well. Batter, do you see the same thing or similar? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I hate the negative connotation around investor. That for me always, um, you know, uh, is, is a pet peeve of mine. And I say that because who who are a typical buyer? Well, I can tell you at CenterCore, a typical buyer is someone like my parents, right? Who who bought a home in uh, the suburbs, probably in the early '90s. Uh, for you know a few hundred thousand dollars, and um, that's been the best performing you know investment of of in in their history, and you know they're not sophisticated, they're not trading derivatives or buying cryptocurrencies, but what they know is that real estate has worked out really well for them. It was a, def a defensive purchase, and they are planning for the future. So uh, you know they're buying something that they know that they can touch, that they can see in a market that they're very experienced in. And that's a typical investor. And I think um, people would be very hard pressed uh, uh, to make a decision on where they're gonna live uh, five years or six years from now. So I think the market here actually needs investors. We need these people to be entrepreneurial, to make a bit of a bet here and say, yeah, I believe in this project because it provides housing for the next generation when it's ready, when, you know, um, you know better at 10 years ago it would walk into a condo and say, yeah, this is a place I wanna live. Right. So um, I, I think they're absolutely necessary. They provide rental stock. They provide housing stock. Um, and yes, they are domestic. And um, I don't think anybody would be upset if, if they saw one of their parents lining up to, to buy a place for, uh, you know, for them or their grandchildren. So um, I think that is who uh, we sell to uh, the vast majority of the time. And, and yes, uh, overwhelmingly Canadian. Um, actually, just to give people some color there, uh, again, the banks, the financial institutions, they look at your project very differently if those buyers are not domestic. Um, that is in itself a safeguard about where money is coming from. Is there speculation? Perhaps. But I think, again, most of the purchasers are genuinely looking to rent out or own this property for the medium to long term. Perfect. And... If we, uh, Winston, you have any to add anything to that comment and your speculation? Uh, I echo uh, the past two panelists uh, spoke about, and uh, especially for the safety net part too, uh, we are one of uh, the, the most straight and conservative um, uh, lending safety net that we have, both to the developer and then also uh, to the purchase itself too. So go on the day that you can randomly buy two or three uh, condominium without mortgage approval, and then you'll be able to, to get the funding. Uh, right now, uh, everything is more straight. Uh, in terms of uh, the approval process, uh, in terms of the stress test and all that too. And I think we have the one of uh, the most safeguarded financial system ever in North America. So I think that part will mitigate the risk. Thank you so much. And again, thank you so much for the panel for joining us today. But uh, we have one final question I would love to bring uh, Andy back to answer uh, right up his alley. Uh, the question is with respect to affordability and politics. How do you think government intervention will affect the market, Andy? What a joyous question. Thank you. Um, thank you, Grace. Uh, well, let me start with this comment. Uh, housing is the most highly regulated commodity that we produce. It's more highly regulated than the Atomic Energy Control Commission in the production of a nuclear power plant. You as an industry, and credit to this panel, listen to the expertise and the creativity and the strength of those individuals. Uh, we've been able to overcome, despite government intervention in our marketplace uh, for ever and ever, as long as I've been in this business, it doesn't ever seem to get less. 
it seems to get more. Why? Because governments will place their emphasis on the demand side of the equation, not the supply side. And if we can ever shift this thinking process over to the supply side, it is absolutely fundamental. And particularly as mentioned by several of the panelists on the, on the approval process, uh, let me just say one comment. You're going to see two things. One, one brilliant maneuver by the federal government uh, this past year was to uh, secure our 400,000 target of new, new immigrants to Canada by allowing those that were already here under temporary visas and student permits to apply for permanent residency. That was 70% of our immigration levels at 400 grand, 400,000. That, that's an amazing achievement. It'll slip to about 50% for this year. And I hope that they hold it there. It's a very clever, very strong position to take the those that are here working already, going to school and allow them permanent residency. We wanna keep you here. If we've trained you and educated you and you've gained skill here, uh, stay. Uh, that's a marvelous program. Uh, but the, most of government's actions will be on things like you'll see much discussion coming up on a spec tax law uh, to get at what was perceived the flipper, uh, particularly in high rise. And you've just heard from the panelists that that's simply not the case. The foreign buyers tax already there 15% negligible impact because we don't have a direct foreign investment uh, into Toronto at this moment of any consequence, a very small portion of the buying public. But the political side will always focus on demand. And one of the, one of the keys we have to do is move it to supply. And finally, uh, the impact here really is to say to our political leadership, um, stay out of the demand side equation, even though that's the easiest way for them to appear to be doing something on the housing market. Just stay out of the way and stay focused on the provision of supply. And if we do that, we'll kiss the ground and enjoy this great city that it already is. When I get off a plane, I literally kiss the ground when I arrive here and say that I love this place. This is a great city. It's been fabulous to me and my family and my company. And we, we are privileged to be able to work here. Let's not, let's not find ways to uh, lose that privilege. Let's find ways to strengthen it. And, and I think we can do it. And your panel today, Grace, has been just outstanding because they, they're, the, they're the next generation of those about to make this difference. And uh, what a fabulous group they are. That's yes, they point. are. No, thank you, Andy, for that, that answer uh, to the question. And again, thank you, Batter, Cash, Winston, Shakara. Thank you so much for your time and taking, uh, taking that time to come up, uh, come up to this panel and start speaking to our audience. I'm going to pass it back to Chris uh, to wrap up and our draw. Thanks, everyone. And again, I echo Grace, uh, a great panel and a great conversation. So now it's time for our draw, courtesy of CIBC uh, for lunch. Um, uh, courtesy of CIBC, the winners will get an email from our friends at the bank. So our first winner is Calum McLaughlin from Slateford. And number two, Al Libfeld from Tribute. Congratulations, oh, Al, and congratulations, Calum. I'd like to thank all of our sponsors. First, CIBC, our title sponsor and our industry partner. SR Law, Balcony Bliss, My Design Studio, Sagan, Smart Touch, Next Home, Buzz Buzz Home, Build, Aurea, Reliance, and Westmount Project. A special thank you to our event producer, McHewitt Partnership. Please, like I mentioned at the beginning of our call, we are always making changes and additions and, and going from good to great with this series. So the one new thing to look out for in your inbox in the next few days is a little recap of today's conversation through our new product that we're launching to the market called the Summit Report. Thanks everyone for joining us. Keep your, um, your inbox open for the next um, invite for next month's session. And we're, we're looking forward to seeing you there. Have a great afternoon and a great rest of the week. Thank you.